Hello, and welcome to Spring and the April episode of the Northampton Shakeras podcast. This month, we'll be hearing from my colleague, Catherine James Oliver, who'll be reading a poem from Norma Watson, who was one of our guests on the first episode of the podcast back in February. Norma sadly died recently, so as a tribute, we'll uh, be hearing one of her poems. And after that, a wide-ranging conversation I had with Dr. David Smart, who was a GP in Northampton for many years, has many other interests too, and uh, you'll be hearing from David in his own words very soon. As always, we're interested at all times in hearing from you about uh, what you enjoy on the podcast, if you've got any ideas for things that we might discuss or include in future episodes, and certainly if you wanted to come in and have a chat with me to talk about your own experience as a carer, then uh, we'd certainly be delighted for you to get in touch. You can do that at uh, our email, which is podcast at northamptonshire-carers.org, or just give the office a call on 01933 677 907. Some, a poem by Norma Watson, written in 2011. Some came by boats, some came by planes. That's the way the journey was made. Some was light, could pass for white. Brown, dark brown, black from the hills, from the valleys. Uptown, downtown, trench town, bridge town. Some speaky, spoky, some hoity-toity. No island left untouched. Men in suits with gold teeth, ladies in hats, hair straight and not a curl in sight. The grip firmly held. Children dressed like mum and dad with tear-stained faces. What lies ahead? Speculation? Desperation? Anticipation? The aim was all the same. One thing for sure, the streets are paved with gold. Double-wrapped is the rose breadfruit. The passport and the piece of paper with the address carefully placed together in an envelope. The grip firmly held Heathrow, Gatwick and Southampton. They were kept busy with the new arrivals. Business was booming. Some found fame, some found fortune. Some were guests at Her Majesty's pleasure. And when gold could not be found, ended up in jackets which kept them straight. An injection now and then to keep them calm. Men on the prowl for wives, women looking for good providers. Now, five years later, some went back, some stayed and made the best of it, and some went back in a box. Ten years later, one day, one day. Twenty years later, one day, one day. Thirty years later, who knows me there now anyway? My last cousin died the other day. The dances and house parties stopped as the cemeteries fill up. And aching bones can no longer do the scar and the mashed potato. Not much talking now of going back home, just talk of the home in the sky. Going to the day centre. Sitting in the armchair doing Tai Chi. Even having meals on wheels. Yams and bananas, too hard to digest. Rice and peas burn my stomach. A little spot will do. (laughs) Men once with gold teeth now have no teeth. Women once with straightened hair make do with what's left. Men wash and go. Children are old and thinking of putting parents in care homes. BMWs are exchanged for Zimmer frames, wheelchairs, and mobility scooters are the in thing. The bold swagger is now propped up with a walking stick. The voice which once sang with John Holt now tries to keep in tune with When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Hands which once held red stripe and white rum now shake as medication is taken. 
the bold voice which once asks, What time ya come round later? Now complains when the talking service is late. I have to sleep at a certain time, or I can't sleep. Chuh! Pert bosoms now sag. I just can't find the right size bra. Once flat bellies now bulge. <laughs> Chairs groan with excessive weight. I, I, I don't eat much, you know. Any more potato pudding left? You drink all the carrot juice? Forgive me, Beverly. I promised to send for you. I was a young, hot-blooded man. I followed the others. Mama said every day for six months you went to the post office to collect the letter with the passage money until they put you in the madhouse. So, so sorry, Bev. Never, the last letter you sent said, Goal or no goal, England is too cold, I am not coming. Then one month after you married Winston, my best friend, and went to America. Oh, by the way, the baby was a boy. Who turned out good? He's my right hand. I never married. I kept hoping one day, one day. <laughs> now some have stroke, suffer with dementia, diabetics, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, bad nerves, bad heart, bad back, bad hips, bad hand, bad foot, no foot, bad chest, wheezing and sneezing. Look around. The planes and boats brought a people who brought a legacy. Some got the gold, but we all got the snow. It's great to be joined by Dr. David Smart, who was uh, a GP in Northampton for 30 years. He's clinical director with the General Practice Alliance and is also chair of Action for Happiness and I think also the Wellbeing Forum for Northampton. I know there's many roles I do, Adam. It kind of it's um, you know, trying not to retire. I think is is the answer. But yes, it's a, I'm, I chair the local health and well-being for, forum for a Northampton locality. I think, and it's a chair of the Action for Happiness Hub Northants, which we're very proud of because we're the exemplar site. I know here at Northampton Shakeras, we've had some training sessions around Action for Happiness, and they're also running some. Happy cafes, but I just wanted to start uh, really by asking, what led you to decide to become a GP? Oh, that long ago? You want to go that far back? <laughs> wow, yeah, kind of. Okay, so why did I want to be a GP? I think um, I'm always interested in science. Is one thing, um, and so my chemistry uh, teacher said, um, "What about medicine?" And I thought, "Oh," and I was at the, I was of the age where there was J.P.R. Williams, who was a medic. There was David Owen, who's a, a medic, and there, so it was this idea of it. The opportunity of going to medicine is something that there's many route, routes you could go down and many opportunities. So it was just that curiousness of what could, it could open up. And I grew up, I think, in a, a primary care team. My dad was a vicar. Um, my mum was a midwife. My sister, a health visitor. And my other sister into education. So I just grew up in amidst, you know, this kind of integrated team and a holistic approach of, of health and the whole being. And I think that's, that's what made me interested. And, you know, it was, uh, I mean, when I said I wanted to be thinking about being medicine, my mum was very pleased. So you get that encouragement from, from family and it wasn't too out of my reach. It was a bit. I, I enjoyed A-level so much I took them twice. Uh, but no, it was, it was good. I know that you worked as a GP for quite a long time. And... I was interested as to what you found to be the best aspects of, of being a GP. Oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, best aspects, I think, being part of a team. We had a great team at Leicester Terrace, and it was just lovely to work alongside people, uh, Fiona Moore and Katie Corson at, at the end, and John Toby. So lots of great people, who, and you stand on the, the shoulders of giants. So John and Kevin, who I started, and John Walton, who were there at the start. You, 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 the, that's a team, but the, the patient contact, you have this great privilege of sharing people's lives, their difficult moments, um, and, the, and the happy moments. But generally, you're dealing with a lot of difficulty and pain and you're able to see people's journey through life um, so it's a great privilege great privilege interesting when you were talking about 
earlier a holistic approach being really important to you and I know you also have an ongoing interest in mental health so would you say a bit about that? Yeah, why, why, yeah. Where did that start? <laughs> when I was 24 my sister died so I was 18 so dealing with that sudden I'd had a really happy childhood but that sudden juxtaposition of immense pain and immense sorrow and I just trying to put my world back together um, and on that journey um, of pain and dealing with that I think it helped me to think this is of an interest. How do I make sense of it? Um, and I think that took me into the sense of, yeah, making sense of pain, suffering. And I think that is part of the construct of mental health. And there must be something in our family because my sister's a manager of one of the big um, health trusts in London. So mental health must have something. To, we had a lot of people rock up at the door to the, to the vicarage with um, mental health problems. And so we had a lot of exposure to different people and we were trying to accept them all. Having talked about the best aspects of working as a GP, I was wondering about the flip side of that really and the, the most challenging elements. My last six months of COVID and the COVID and thinking, wow, I've come and I'm coming up to 60 and I'm, I'm going to, you know, GPs were dying in the front line and you, you know that anxiety of is it going to be me am I going to get this what is this whole thing but also just seeing patients die you know just we had a care home outbreak and lost 50 percent of a whole care home and you know that um, and managing the exposure you know how do you go and you know degown after each patient and yeah. keep yourself safe and and so that was not good um so the ending uh, sadly um I think is uh not traumatic, but I think that was difficult. I think seeing how uh, mental health, now it has been recognised, but having 30 years where it hasn't been recognised, that has been a great frustration. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, was, I was saying this on a podcast uh, last month, I think it was, that, that um, there was a recognition, as you say, to around mental health and the impact of isolation on people during that that kind of whole period from our organization's point of view we're conscious of the fact that carers often are isolated and that probably doubled down on that in a sense but it's also interesting and gardeners world isn't the be all and end all of everything however i know that monty don will f frequently talk about and during the covid period and beyond he'll talk about mental health and the importance of your garden and going out into nature for, for your mental health so, so uh yeah, it's, it's, so it's interesting that you say that, really. It was a watershed of, um, it was the first time politicians recognised that actually it wasn't just people dying that mattered, it was actually how people live. Yeah. And actually this sense of, are we flourishing? And and I think all of this and, and how decisions made mattered to people's mental health. And it was really taken into account for the first time sensibly and in a, in, a, in a real way. And the other aspect of it is we know COVID has exacerbated people's problems in mental health, the lockdown, in particular for people who are older, and being stuck together, being stuck as a carer is hard work. Yeah. We know this. We know carers have their own big issues in facing mental health problems, but in particular when you can't get out and about, that's yeah. a real problem. I think as well that, that, that it, it was something that we, in, to, to varying sort of degrees, that we all shared as well in the sense that, well, I know for myself that, that, that uh, for our organisation we were all working from home, I frequently just felt the need to speak yeah, to somebody else yeah. that I'd normally yeah. see in the office. <laughs> well, we, we are, we are um, collective animals. We, are, we need each other. No, no, no woman or man is an island. And... Um, you know, we need need to be part of um, a community, and when you're off on your own, that's not good for your well-being. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, how do we connect? That's one of the ten keys. Um, you know, in relating, how do we do that? When you know, Zoom was okay, it was great to see this expanse of screen and, the, and be able to connect with people and that fun initially. But boy, you know, rapidly tired from that. Yeah, and I, th I think I think you're right, and I think that it's a different. It's a different way of communicating and, and it, it's, it makes it more difficult in some ways to communicate because, I mean, there's, there's getting used to the technology for one, but, but if, as we're doing now, we can see one another in the room 
and you can nod and you can kind of know when one person's finished speaking and the other person's going to start. But I think with, with Zoom or Teams or whatever, it's, it's, uh, it's much more difficult than, than, than the usual conversation and, and the, the, the place in which we'd normally have those conversations, really. Well, I think that was a point of the difficulty you mentioned with the hard bit of that last six months. Online consulting is an alien to me. The consultation was what really took me into practice. And so in that communication, but it isn't just, it's a body language, it's how, and obviously if I'd pressed my buzzer, I could then, people had to come and um, hear the buzzer, they had to come up some steps and then come into my room. Yeah. So actually by the time somebody's come to my room, I've done quite a bit of an assessment. Yeah. Um, whereas just pick up the phone, who is it? Uh, you don't know. It yeah. may not be the person you were intending. And yeah. all of this is, uh, so that, that was, so online consulting is not the same and online relating is not the same as a one-to-one. Uh, following on from that, that that for a patient that coming in to see you face to face, it may well be that they feel much more comfortable to talk about maybe the main presenting sort of concern for them, but it might also open up other conversations as well, which is probably less easy if you've got the the kind of barrier of it being on the end of a phone or something. Absolutely. Just body language, how people hold themselves. You know, as a GP of 30 years, you understand that the eye contact, there's a whole story that people tell you just by if you observe and, and, and watch, which you can't do on the end of a line. And um, you may get a bit of a nuance of tone, but it's it's hard. And, and you know, the whole different signs, physical signs, um, you know, the person can't stand up, you know, I, mean, but I would know that yes. <laughs> if, yeah. if they're yeah. coming to the surgery, but you don't know um, at home. So lots of stuff that, uh, about how we relate um, and enable each other to be listened to. And that I've learned even in retirement, how much more we just need to be listened to and heard really matters. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting sort of uh, relating that to, well, quite a lot of the work that we do at Northampton Shakaras really that 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 um if I'm talking to somebody if somebody one of my colleagues on the su- carer support line is talking to somebody it's actually doing that active listening if you like um and and your time is for that person you're not thinking about something else you're kind of focused in on that and 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 um sadly I think in in life generally then there's not a lot of that that happens there's a great book by Eric Byrne and games people play that I remember from yeah, years and years ago. And he said, we have five minutes of intimacy where nobody's playing games and we actually just truly meet. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> that's not a lot in life. Actually, I think, actually, it's, I've gone through my life, I think probably that may actually be true. Yeah. Um, even for me, who I do count myself as you know, a skilled communicator because I've yeah. trained in it. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's, I think, being listened to, being heard, being understood. I, that was a great joy. You were saying joy is a general practice. When you'd meet somebody and they say, you get me, Doc, you understand. Yeah. And that, that meeting of minds, a meeting of souls, a meeting of literal living beings together, and that's, yeah. whoa, that, that, there's nothing like that. Certainly a big question. In the wider sense, how do you feel the NHS has changed of time that you've been, been part of it, really, and, and some of the and it's it's a the million dollar question, but some of the some of the key issues that you see going forward, really. There's some aspects where I turn it around and say I don't know that it has. I do think there is. Uh, if I'm really honest, I'd say I think that the NHS is mainly deck chairs being rearranged on the Titanic. The deck the, the NHS can't continue in its present form. There's lots of people writing on this that uh, the NHS makes 20% difference to health outcomes. Behaviour change makes 30%. So why aren't we actually beginning to think of how we enable people to live healthier lives? People are choosing to think about lifestyle medicine and choosing to think about different ways of looking at medicine and whose health is it anyway? And I think um, a lot of illnesses are pharmaceutical created. There you have the drug which can create and solve a problem and then you create an illness to... um, So I think there's a lot for me and I think I was part of the Prozac generation of GPs and... Um, and I do think, anti- that be, hear me, that antidepressants work for people with severe depression, but they were overused for people with lifestyle problems. Yeah. So I think the NHS, one, I think hasn't changed in some ways. It's still an illness management service, not a health service. 
So I think that I would clearly say. Two, I think um, the focus on prevention has has waxed and waned, but I think um, recent years the cut in public uh, health and uh, budgets and prevention budgets, the government not choosing to look at uh, unit price for alcohol or cutting smoking, advertising, these very simple measures would be a big change and so we've moved away a bit from prevention and we've glorified hospitals more as time has gone on the big uh, political um, goal rather than thinking what is this service about what we really aiming for what is health as i started a more holistic view of health so i think those be some of the changes lots of fancy it lots of fancy apps and other things going around, although I love the Action of Happiness app, I will say that, but uh, lots of other things that are seen as technological solutions to health, but sitting down with somebody, listening to somebody, looking at how we create behaviour change, these are the things that really matter. And again, it's that it's that kind of face-to-face, having time for people in a very real sense, rather than, than, than through a screen or, or, or some other method, isn't it, really? It kind of neatly brings me on, because you mentioned prevention there that that uh since since you retired from from uh from leicester terrace you've been working as clinical director prevention and mental health for the general practice alliance and obviously that's got both prevention and mental health as as part of it but I'd be certainly interested in hearing you talk a little bit about that but i'm also conscious that there may be a number of people listening to this that that might think um I'm not quite sure what the General Practice Alliance is. So so I wondered if you could just say a little bit about that. So really, um, if you think of um, a general practice is, you know, you, it should be my doctor, my patient type arrangement. And then you have a practice, which is a group of doctors working together. That was pretty unique when I started of getting a team of GPs in one room. People who originally had original you know, personal lists. And then you have, we've progressed that. So the next step up now is practices working within primary care networks so three or four practices working the primary care network and then the next layer above that is you know four or five as we have in Northampton primary care networks working as within a federation and so we are a GP federation which is an infrastructure organization um, that supports GP practices like VIN uh, voluntary Pat North Hans supports the voluntary sector we try and help our local practices and we're place-based so we're around Northampton there are other federations around the county. And just going back back to the fact that your role with them is clinical director prevention and mental health that wondered if say say a little bit about what that uh, that involves. Well I think I started out in mental health really looking at um, the consultation and then I did some training as a counsellor and then realised I can't counsel people in general practice so we got a team approach of counsellors so I was labelled then as a GP with an interest in mental health and ended up doing yeah. a bit around promoting mental health so that became my and that, that was my career really how to enable uh, mental health to be championed how pathways um, which I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve in Northamptonshire but so I continued in that vein as a clinical director yeah. the prevention I think is more recent i think it's more looking at the last 10 years particularly with action of happiness the uh, you know prevention agenda of trying to as i think desmond tutu said if there's instead of picking people up out of the stream find out why they're being pushed into the the stream and i think that's a bit of me working upstream health um how can we look at the predeterminants and that prevention agenda poverty is the biggest for mental health yeah. very close link and working in semi-long that link with deprivation and mental health is both a, a, pre-de- a predetermined and also a consequence of mental disorder people don't you know function as well as they could and get the jobs they could so both the consequence but poverty and the best thing we could do is to persuade the government to give everybody a living wage that would be the biggest impact um, nationally on our mental health yeah, that's 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 really interesting, and the the link as well between poverty and so many things uh, that mental health and physical health and and the outcomes for people if if they're deprived of 
certain things. There's a really good bit. There's a, in the we make a mental prevention concordat, which is this whole big strand of work that looks and brings all this evidence together. But in that, there's a lovely, which I just nugget, which is really worth noting, that people with low well-being have difficulty in what's called a delayed gratification. They can't put things off, mm-hmm. so they reach out for a quick fix. So a drink, a smoke, the quick bit of carbohydrate. Whereas actually people with better well-being can then have that more planned and more healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So what that means is people who have low well-being and their well-being and their social um, inequalities are made worse by their life choices, by their health choices. Whereas actually if we could address the underlying cause, the low well-being, then they would be enabled and be able to choose for themselves a healthier lifestyle, which is why I get frustrated that we don't build mental health into making every contact count. It's all just physical choices rather than thinking, let's look at the underlying well-being. Let's look at what matters to this person. So the personalisation agenda, which I've tried to champion, is key to that. Just, just sort of uh, brings to mind the Tim Spector and the Zoe project um, and, and I know he did loads of stuff around COVID um, that, that, uh, but there's also some stuff uh, that I know they're doing around food and mood um, which uh, yeah just sort of triggered that thought in my mind as you were saying that. Well, yeah he's a great hero of mine and uh, so love the Zoe app and if people don't know it just have a Google and some of the studies going on with it but brilliant but the gut biome has really come up in the last decade. If you're saying, what's the new change in health? Mm. I would say the evidence base around the gut biome of the bacteria we have in our bowel, creating hormones and creating how we feel and neurochemicals. So actually you've got more serotonin receptors in your gut than you have in your head. Um, So actually we should be really thinking about our nutrition and having not just five, but 30 different things in a week Mm spices nuts and fruit and things and they're weak and that's uh but the zoe app and uh tim Spector, great great yeah, guy yeah yeah so i certainly found it really interesting i mean I, I first encountered it during the pandemic really i was sort of dipping into it and then when i had covid for the first time um i thought okay let's 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 have a have a look at this need some really interesting videos and then he talked about his own experience when he develop covid but but the whole immune system our inflammation and recognizing that a lot of our autoimmune diseases um, relate to what we eat Mm -hmm. and therefore actually this is something we can make positive change in doing um, and we've certainly done it as a as a household so i've lost i think i was 103 i'm now about 89 kilos so just changing nutrition really matters and you've mentioned Action for Happiness and your, ch- your chair of that. So obviously, this all feeds into to this, what we've been talking about. So I wondered if you'd say a little bit about what Action for Happiness is and, and, and the sorts of things that, that, that they're, they're doing, really. Well, this really came out of the... There's a brilliant, brilliant report called the Foresight and uh, Report on Mental Capital and Wellbeing 2008. And Tony Blair came and said, well, you know, five through today. We're just talking about that nutritional aspect, five through today. And so you had the five ways to well-being were born out of that, you know, um, but nobody could ever remember the, the five ways. So I used to test my public health colleagues, and I may even test you, Adam, say what the five ways are, but people find it difficult to remember. But, you know, the 10 keys came along, which were great, which are the same as the five ways. So you can now remember giving, relating, yeah. exercise, awareness, and trying something new which are the five ways. But then the positive psychology and uh, movement around um, what matters to to our well-being, and these are evidence-based, so it's setting goals, direction, how we bounce back, resilience, being an attitude of gratitude, emotion, and acceptance of self, know yourself and your strengths, um, all of those abilities. And then meaning, you know, spirituality or other aspects. So for me, I then had this framework of a bio, physical, psycho, psychological, social and spiritual framework. And to me, that just made, wow, that makes sense. And so for me, when I started thinking about it for my own life, I had an episode of low mood um, for myself. But then I put it into clinical practice and sharing with patients and patients used to be able to just, yeah, I get that. But they're giving them and empowering them of something they can do for themselves. And it both prevents mood disorder, because if you do those things like exercise, healthy nutrition, sleep hygiene, and um, 
uh, mindfulness. It can prevent relapses of mood disorder. But also, as you're coming out of an episode, it can help your recovery journey. Yeah. So it's so this double win uh, for me. So, yeah, I've become, as you can tell, a bit 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 passionate about it <laughs> <laughs> no that's a good that's a good thing uh that's i know that um f- in my day job isn't of hosting this podcast but sure. um it's uh, uh managing the, the community companion service and, and we've got a twitter account and we we follow action for happiness and sure. and often sort of retweet stuff you know that you can find out more he says having it handily in front of him action for happiness.org is the place to to go it's an aladdin's cave so action for happiness and that's f-o-r dot yeah. dot org yeah actionforhappiness.org and there you've got and the great thing is there's an app which I just encourage everybody to download the app is in itself you've got the calendar on it you've got daily reminders you've got a community of people talking and just offering nice photos and you have this library of brilliant international speakers being interviewed by Mark Williams so um, and it's just it is just an an Aladdin's cave and there's a 10-day coaching course what more could you ask for in one place yeah that's certainly well worth uh, investigating you probably end up spending quite a bit of time there if you if you do check it out it's better than American housewives yeah (laughs) yeah to, to to end it's 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 a bit of a sort of left field but I'm just always interested in this um that uh is there anything that you've either been listening to musically or on the radio or watching on TV or streaming services over the last little while that you kind of think, yeah, that was really good? Or maybe it, it influenced your, your mood or, or, or you felt it kind of had an, an effect on your well-being? Well, I think the Action of Happiness, I would say that, wouldn't I? But the Action of Happiness app, there was one on um, Active Hope that I'd listened to that really just... That was down a time which, which is just good for me. And then there's a Louis channel. I can't remember exactly the name of it, but there's one on, I think it's called the Louis channel. And it's a, a guy who does amazing photos. He did the, the fungi. And I've just been looking at this and his v- filming, but also uh, that it's just very brief two minute films. Yeah. And that is just stunning photography, but just very uplifting. So yeah. those are two things. And, uh, I think the best thing, to be honest, is not just look at streaming. I just go out into nature, and I think just I just love nature and just flowers and uh, just looking at spring bursting forth and and that 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 to me is uh, the best stream. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean, and I think that that you can be away from electronic devices and all of those things. Great though they are. Uh, in their place but I think that you can kind of just clear your mind really and just listen to the sounds around you and I, that's 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 one of my go-to things have it going out for a, a walk and just looking and listening or a cycle yeah. or a cycle Adam I love, yeah. you go, I love getting on my bike and going for two or three hour cycle through um through Northamptonshire and yeah. just my mind is I'm transformed yeah yeah it, it does it does make a difference but I mean that's again linked to the impact of exercise on on your mood and well-being sort of tv or some some sometimes some tv programs that appear called slow tv i don't know whether you've ever come across those but they are quite interesting because it might be reindeer going through the arctic or whatever uh there's not much dialogue it's just just quite sort of peaceful really i think doing doing things looking at television or nature where you're engaged but you're not thinking too much you, you, the other our cloud brain can come in and dealing with complex issues it's a great thing i think hippocrates said if uh, if you're feeling a bit down go for a walk and he said if you're still feeling a bit down go for another one and i think that's a yeah. great truth yeah and that was dr david smart and we've reached the uh, end point of uh, this april 2023 podcast for northamptonshire carers if you want to get in touch uh, we're certainly uh, keen to hear from you. You can get in touch via podcast at northamptonshire-carers.org on email. Or why not give us a call on 01933 677 907. We'll be back in May, the end of that month, with a podcast with a particular theme around both Carers Week and Volunteers Week. Until then, it's goodbye and I'll be talking to the taxman about poetry until we speak again.